You are listening to Escape Room, authored by Christopher Edge and narrated to you by Audiobooks with Keeper of Lost Stories. Chapter 11 Rocks tumble around me as I fall. It's like I'm caught in a landslide, pitched forward and downwards into the dark. I feel my body twist, legs desperately bicycling against empty air. I keep trying to grab hold of something in the blackness, but nothing meets my flailing hands. Bam! My shoulder crashes against stone. The sudden impact knocking the breath out of me. It's like I have been slammed into a brick wall as I lie sprawled in pain. The ground feels hard against my face. For a moment, I don't move, trying to work out if I have broken anything. All I can hear in the darkness are my own juddering breaths. Then I see a flicker of light which brightens with a crackle to form a spreading orange glow. Every part of me aches as I pull myself upright, seeing the others scrambling to their feet too. We seem to be standing in some kind of chamber. The light coming from a burning torch that's fixed high on the nearest wall. The stone walls are covered in carvings, the strange figures of monsters and men looming in the gloom. Unlike the endless library of dust that we have just escaped from, this chamber is only 10 meters long and maybe half as wide. In the center of the room is what looks like a solid stone table, the rough floor around it strewn with bones. I think they look human. Glancing back over my shoulder, I see a vaulted stairway choked with rubble. This must be the landslide that brought us here, a wall of stone that shows there's no way out. I turn back to face the others. The three of them are staring straight at me. Adoha is the first to speak. Where's men? Her dark braids frame a look of real worry. Lips burst as she waits for my reply. But as I meet Adoha's gaze, all I can see in my mind is Min's face turning to dust. She is gone, I say, struggling to speak. I try to pull her back, but she did not want to come. The door was closing, the dust swarming everywhere. I watched her disintegrate. My words trail away as I feel a tear rolling down my face. There is a moment of silence and then Oscar laughs out loud. You are right, he says. You are such a sucker, Amy. What do you mean? I say, staring back at him in disbelief. Didn't you hear what I said? Didn't you see what was happening out there? Oscar sniffs, wiping the dust from his face with the back of his sleeve. Special effects, he replies. That's all it was. The fire, the dust, the disappearing men. It's all just part of the story. This is the ultimate escape game, remember? This isn't a game, I say, raising my voice to a shout. My gaze falls on the scattered bones and I feel my heart twist. I just watch men crumble into dust. That's what they want you to think you saw, Oscar says, brushing the dust from his hands. Min wasn't one of us. She knew too much. Just think about all those hints she gave. She was part of the game and now they have got her out of the way to see how we cope on our own. Standing close by, Abraham slowly nods his head. I've heard some escape room do this, he says. Put a person on the team playing the game to keep tabs on them. They will give clues if they see the team getting stuck, but they never let on that they are really an actor. You see, Oscar says, nodding his head in Abraham's direction. He knows what I'm talking about. Don't worry about men. She'll be back safely with the host. They are probably watching us right now. He looks around the chamber as if searching for a hidden camera. So we need to show them we can find the answer on our own. I know what I saw, I protest. As Oscar turns away, I glance across to Adoha looking for support. But my friend just shrugs her shoulder. Maybe he is right, Amy, she says. It's like they are desperate to convince themselves that this is still a game. I feel a flicker of doubt creep into my mind. How can I be sure that what I saw was really true? Surely dad would not have brought me here if he thought there was any chance of me getting hurt. I remember Min's fingers brushing against mine as I felt her start to disintegrate. But the clouds of dust could have hidden what was really happening. Maybe it was just smoke and mirrors. 
So what is this place? Oscar's gruff question pulls me back to the present. Some kind of ancient ruin? I look around the vaulted chamber. Its rough stone roof not much higher than our heads. Shadows dance across the sculpted walls, the shapes of skulls and hieroglyphs hemming us into one side. At least I know why they call this the escape. There is no way out again. We are inside a Mayan temple, Adoha says, leaning closer to inspect the stone carvings. This is the burial chamber. Who's Amaya? Oscar sneers. And why is she buried here? The Mayans were an ancient civilization, Adoha replies, ignoring the sneer in Oscar's question. They ruled for more than a thousand years, building great cities in the forest of Mexico and Central America. And then they just disappeared, abandoning their cities as this civilization collapsed. The palaces and pyramids lay hidden for centuries, just lost deep in the jungle until their ruins were discovered by interbred explorers. Wait a minute, Ibrahim says, raising his hand, as if asking a question in class. I thought it was the ancient Egyptians who built the pyramids. Adoha shakes her head. The Mayans built pyramids too, with steep steps on every side. At the top was a temple where priests carried out human sacrifices. While inside the pyramids, explorers found secret tunnels, chambers and traps. This is where... We must be now inside the heart of a mine pyramid. How do you know all this? I ask. Not sure where Adoha is pulling all these facts from. Were you reading the rough guide to ancient civilizations while I was climbing that ladder back in the library? Adoha grins and replies. <laughs> the 13th level of Tomb Raider underworld is set in a mine temple, she says. That's how I recognize these hieroglyphs. I told you this game was made for me. Ibrahim frowns as he looks around the chamber. So we just need to find the secret tunnel and avoid the traps, right? We need to find the answer, Oscar says, striding toward the long stone table that's set in the middle of the floor. So get looking. Sticking out her tongue behind Oscar's back, Adoha still seems to follow his order. Turning away from the Mayan hieroglyphs to start searching the chamber, pushing all thoughts of men out of my mind, I follow her lead looking around for any kind of clue. I think the only way out of this game is to win it. Glancing down at the desiccated bones strewn around my feet, I recognize the shapes of ribs, femurs, vertebrae from the pages of my encyclopedia. They are definitely human. A shudder runs down my spine as I stare into the hollow eye sockets of a cracked skull as its yellow teeth grin back at me. Are these the bones of people who were buried here? I ask, my voice echoing off the walls, even though it's barely more than a whisper. Adoha shakes her head. They're human sacrifices, she says, stepping over the jumbled cascade of bones. When a mine noble died, their servants were killed to accompany them into the afterlife. She points to the long stone table that Oscar is now standing behind. That's who's buried here. Stepping closer, I realize now that it isn't a table but a sacrificus. A solid slab of stone rests on top of the monolithic coffin, swirling patterns and hieroglyphs carved into its flagstone lid. Near the top, I see a small circular hollow and catch a glint of red deep inside the spy hole. It reminds me of the red dot I saw in the center of the camera lens and the one that gleamed from the black pearl in the chess player's turban. Inside my mind, I hear the whisper of the host's word again. I will be monitoring your every move. Oscar was right. He is watching us now. Leaning closer, Adoha is already expecting the strange carvings. The largest of these is a circle with swirling spirals set inside. This is the symbol of Khunab Ku, she says. Her voice hushed as her fingers trace the shape. Some say the Mayans believed he was the god who created everything. You should know what the answer is then, grunts Oscar. I'm expecting Adoha to roll her eyes at Oscar's interruption, but instead she eagerly nods her head. He should, she replies, her dark eyes gleaming with excitement. Don't you see? This means we are on the right track. The Mayans believe that Hunapku lived in the center of the Milky Way. That's what the spiral shape represents, the galaxy we live in. 
Others call it the galactic butterfly. Some say the symbol of the Hunapku shows the gateway to all knowledge. So this must be where the answer is. Oscar cracks his knuckles with a grin. Let's get the lid off this thing then. Chapter 12 It's useless, Oscar shouts, stepping away as he wipes the sweat from his face. You bunch of weaklings are no help at all. We have been trying to shift this solid slab of stone for what feels like ours, the four of us straining to push the lid off the sacrophagus to reveal the contents within. But in all that time, we have managed to move it even a single centimeter. It weighs a ton. Says you, Adoha snaps in reply. Here's the one puzzle that needs brute force instead of brains, and it turns out that you are all mouth. As the two of them start to argue, I turn away with a heavy sigh. Adoha seems convinced that the answer lies inside this sacrifice, but I can't shake the nagging feeling that something's not quite right. I look around the gloom of the burial chamber, peering into the flickering shadows as I try to work out what's wrong. Ibrahim is crouching close to the floor, his head bent as he peers at something that he's found here. What is it? I ask, wondering if he's feeling the same as me. Brushing his dark hair away from his face, Ibrahim glances up at me with a pensive frown. I found these bones. I look down at the skeletal bones scattered in the dust. I know, I say, feeling a prickle of fear creep across my skin. Horrible, isn't it? Adoha says they were sacrificed. Ibrahim nods. And it looks like they did something to them too. He picks up one of the scattered bones and shows it to me. Look. The bone that he's holding looks like a femur, the long bone you find in the upper leg. This one is about half a meter long, but as Ibrahim turns the bone over, I see there's something strange about it. On one end of the bone is rounded like normal, but the other end seems to have been sharpened to a chiseled edge. Is it a weapon, do you think? Taking it from his hand, I stare at the sharpened bone, trying to work out what it might have been used for. I don't think it's a weapon. It's not a spear or a sword, even though its edge looks sharp enough to cut. Strangely, the shape of it reminds me more of a doorstop, one of those things that you wet under the bottom of a door to stop it from banging shut. Although here, there is no door to hold open. I look up to meet Abraham's gaze. His head is tilted slightly to one side, as if he is looking at the world from a different angle. I remember what Adoha called him as we walked through the stacks in the library. She said he was a finder, someone who sees the things everyone else has missed. This bone must be important somehow. I hear the sound of a hand slapped against stone and look back to see Oscar and Adoha still arguing across the sacred figure's lid. If you can't lift it, then we'll just have to break it open, Oscar growls. Adoha was right, Oscar's a destroyer. But as I look from the flagstone lid that rests on the top of the sacrifagus to the chiseled bone that I'm holding, an idea slides into the front of my mind. Maybe this puzzle needs brains rather than brute force, after all. Clambering to my feet, I head back to Oscar and Adoha. As the two of them bicker, I peer instead at the edge of the sacrifagus where the heavy lid meets the stone coffin beneath. It's almost a perfect seal. But in a couple of places, I see cracks and slivers where the stone has been chipped away. They are only knife thin, but if my idea is going to work, I hope this will do the trick. Carefully lining up the bone, I place a sharp chisel edge against one of the cracks. What are you doing? Oscar asks, casting a dismissive glance in my direction. Lifting the lid, I reply. On your own? With a bone? <laughs> Oscar laughs out loud. You have got no chance. It's not a bone, it's a lever, I tell him, sliding the chiseled edge between the base and the lid of the sacred figures. And with the right lever, you can move the whole world. With all the strength I can muster, I pull down hard on the rounded edge of the bone. The lid starts to lift, only millimeters at first. But as I strain to force the lever down, the gap starts to widen. The flag stood lid suddenly sliding away with a rumbling sound before crashing to the floor with a deafening boom. Oscar jumps back with a yelp of surprise. Breathing hard, I stand stock still for a second, still holding the sharpened bone. It actually worked. 
but there was no time to catch my breath as the others quickly crowd round the open sarcophagus. You did it, Adoha says, reaching out to squeeze my hand as I join her there. That was incredible, Amy. Now we can find out what the answer is. Oscar lets out a low whistle as he peers inside the sarcophagus. Who cares what the answer is, he says. It looks like we have found ourselves some proper terror here. A skeleton lies on its back inside the sarcophagus, its bones perfectly preserved. Surrounding it, I can see countless pieces of exquisite jewelry, jade necklaces, silver bracelets, and golden rings. Beads of malachite and pearl lie scattered among tiny carved figurines. But it's not the sight of this treasure that makes me gasp. It's the layer of the bright red dust that covers it all. I'm having this, Oscar says, reaching for a crown that rests on top of the crimson skull. But before he can grab it, Adoha knocks his hand away. Don't touch it, she shouts, her voice thick with fear. The red dust is Chinabar. So what? Oscar says, turning angrily towards her. The stuff's worth a fortune. A bit of cinnamon isn't going to do me any harm. Not cinnamon, Adoha replies, standing her ground as Oscar tries to stare her down. Cinnabar, it means dragon's blood. And it's the most toxic mineral on earth. Just one touch can kill you. The flickering light cast by the torch makes her eyes shine. It's a perfect booby trap. Oscar takes a step back from the dust-encrusted crown, but Abraham is still peering inside the sacrophagus. Who do you think this is? he asks. Adhoa looks down at the crimson skeletal. It's the Red Queen of Palanku, she says, keeping her voice low as if she's afraid of waking the dead. A Mayan noble woman whose tomb was found in the 13th temple of a lost city deep in the jungles of Mexico. Nobody knows her true identity, but the treasures she was buried with led some to believe she was the last Mayan queen. Her body was painted with the dust because it was the same color as the rising sun, and the Mayans thought it would give her the power to rise as well. The Red Queen would live again. I shiver at the thought of this then glance back over my shoulder at the rest of the moans, scattered among her footprints in the dust. No chance of a new life for any of those. Maybe the people with the treasure are the only ones that matter. I thought you said we'd find answer in here, Oscar growls, still looking annoyed by the fact that he can't get his hands on the riches. What was the point of opening the lid if it doesn't take us anywhere? There's no gateway here, just a pile of dusty old bones. Adhoa frowns, but this time she's got no reply. I look again at the crimson skeleton, every piece of treasure caked in the poisonous dust. Maybe Oscar's right. Maybe this is just a red herring. But as my gaze roams across the riches draped over the Red Queen's bones, I glimpse something that seems out of place. Fine pieces of jewelry shine beneath the dust, but between her skeletal fingers, the Red Queen seems to be holding a simple seashell. Inside my mind, I hear the hostess' word. The answer might be found in the most unexpected of places. Pulling a handkerchief from my pocket, I use it to cover my hand and then reach inside the sacrophagus. Careful, Amy, Adoha breathes, as I ease the seashell from the Red Queen's grasp. Don't touch the dust. The outside of the seashell is painted copper red. But as I turn it over carefully in my hand, I see a stone carving hidden inside the cell. It's shaped like a butterfly, its wings marked with the same pattern as the lid. There's no dust inside the cell. So I carefully pick the carved object out with my free hand before dropping the shell and the handkerchief back into the open coffin. As I stare down at the stone butterfly, the others crowd round to take a closer look. What is it? Oscar asks. I'm not sure, I reply, holding the tiny sculpture to the light. As the torchlight flickers, striped patterns of gold shimmer across the butterfly's wings. I know it's only a trick of light, but it looks like it's about to take flight. It's a galactic butterfly, Adoha says, the ghost of a smile creeping across her lips. The Hunatku. As she says this, I feel excitement spark inside my chest. Adoha said before, that the Hunapu showed the gateway to all knowledge. I glance around at the stone walls that surround us, at the gods and monsters guarding this place. This butterfly seems to be carved from the same stone, almost like 
It should fit somewhere here. And as I stare at the strange hieroglyphs that mark the end wall of the chamber, something seems to click inside my mind. If you're looking for the answer, maybe this is the key. Still holding the stone butterfly, I walk towards the far wall, my gaze searching for what I must know should be there. What are you looking for? Abraham asks, hurrying to join me. My finger strays the shapes of the hieroglyphs, the patterns they make swirling in spirals across the solid stone. The graven faces of jaguars and alligators stare sightlessly back at me, the teeth bared in snarls, as if I am trespassing. A way out, I tell him, still searching for a place where the carving might fit. That's what we have been looking for all along. The hatch in the attic, the door in the library, this game is called the escape. So that's what must be hidden here. Some kind of gate that will let us escape. I glance down. I look back at the wall, peering into its shadowy cracks and crevices, as well as the strange faces of beasts and men. I can see the shape of seashells, circles, and lines sculpted out of the stone. What do you think they mean? Abraham asks, his gaze following mine as we trace the sparring shape of the hieroglyphs. But before I can answer, Adohar jumps in with a reply. I think they tell the time, she says, suddenly appearing right by my side. Behind us, I hear a sniggering laugh. You mean like a clock? Oscar says, swaggering up to join us as we scour the wall for clues. Well, it looks like it's stopped. I know he's trying to be funny, but as I stare at the circular patterns that the hieroglyphs make, I can't help but think that it does look like a giant clock face. It's not a clock, Adoha replies, reaching up towards the outermost circle where midnight would strike. It's a calendar. She starts to trace the shape of the circle, passing over each of the carved hieroglyphs as a spiral around. The Mayans didn't just have one calendar like people do today, but three. This is the hub, a solar calendar that lasts for 365 days. Each of these symbols is the Mayan month, Zots, Zek, Zul, Yaksim, and more. 18 months that each lasted for 20 days. As her hand sweeps around to near the start of the circle again, Adoha pauses, her finger is hovering over a strange hieroglyph that looks like a scream. And the nineteenth month of five nameless days that the Mayans called the Vibe. This was a time of great danger when the Mayans believed the gates to the underworld were opened and chaos unleashed on the world. Adua's hushed words echo off the walls of the tomb and I feel my skin prickle with fear. We might be looking for a gate, but as I stare at these carved jaws, I just hope it isn't the one to the underworld. Moving her hand, Adua starts to raise a second circle of hieroglyphs. A wheel within a wheel spiraling around. This is the Sulkin, she says. It's a calendar the minds used to mark their sacred days. Feast, festivals, and ceremonies all were determined by Sulkin. The minds believed it could even predict the future. Mesmerized, I watch as Adoha's fingers follow the hieroglyphs round, shadows falling across these eerie carvings. The minds didn't see time as a straight line she explains. But as a circle turning round, history repeats itself. What has happened before will happen again. The Mayans believed that time was an endless turning cycle that went on and on. Just like you, Oscar mutters under his breath. Adoha ignores him, her fingers coming to rest in the center of the circle. Until the end of the long count, she says. This is the calendar the Mayans used to count the days since the world was created, an age they believed would last for 2,880,000 days. Although I moves her hand away from the wall, and I see the cluster of hieroglyphs that mark the long count. The sculpted shapes of monstrous faces leer back at me, skull-like birds and jaguars, but nestled in the center of them. I see the shadow of a hollow in the sun. Peering closer, I see that this tiny cavity has been carved in the shape of a butterfly, and as I compare it to the stone I'm holding, I realize it's a perfect match. This is it, I say, noticing a faint red glow that seems to emanate from deep inside the hollow. I think I've found the keyhole. Chapter 13 I 
hold the stone butterfly between my fingertips. The spiral patterns on its wings lit with an eerie red glow. It looks as though it's been carved from this hollow. The red light that gleams coming from the deep inside. It's the same light that I've seen all the way through this game. The one that's telling me now that I must be right. As the others crowd round my shoulders, I carefully place the butterfly inside the keyhole, feeling the carving click into place. It fits, Adhoa whispers, her voice hushed in the shadows. Holding my breath, I wait to see what happens next. But as the seconds stretch into silence, I'm forced to let it out again in a puzzled sigh. This can't be right, I say, peering closer to a sea, a faint glow still grooming around the edge of the butterfly's wings. It hasn't worked. It has to work, Adhoa says. It all fits, the gateway, the butterfly, the hunapku. This has to be the key. I turn around, looking to the others for any kind of clue. Ibrahim frowns, looking to the others, his fingers fidgeting as if the hieroglyphs are a Rubik's cube for him to solve. Oscar has his arms folded nonchalantly across his chest, an annoyed all look on his face. What is it? I snap, his smirk already annoying me. If you think it's a key, Oscar says, speaking slowly as if I'm stupid, don't you need to turn it? I blink. He's right. Turning back to the wall, I reach for the butterfly. The carved stone feels smooth, but as I start to turn it, I hear a juddering sound, like the grinding of ancient gears. The spiraling hieroglyphs suddenly shine with an eerie red light, and I watch as the wheels start to turn. It's working, Adoha says, a buzz of excitement in her voice. Keep turning. As I slowly twist the stone butterfly, the hieroglyphs continue to revolve. Mesmerized, I watch as the snarling stone phages wheel round. The roar of hidden machinery making the wall shake. As it turns, the outer wheel seems to be continuing the months off. The symbols that Adwa showed us glowing red as each one glides by. While the inner wheel seems to turn back time as it revolves anti-clockwise, it keeps on turning the key, waiting for a click that never comes. I don't understand, I say, raising my voice over the clattering noise. If this is the gate, why won't it open? What else do we need to do? Let me try, Oscar says, pushing me out of the way to get his hands on the key. There is an act to these things. But as he twists the butterfly key, the concentric circles of hieroglyphs just keep turning. The tomb shaking as they revolve in opposite directions. I glance up in fear as shards of stone start to fall from the ceiling. If we don't stop turning the wheels, we are going to be buried alive. A crimson glow seems to seep through the carved symbols and faces, the color blood red, but there is no sign of any gate starting to open. Maybe it's not a gate, Abraham says, almost as if he is reading my mind. Maybe this is more like the door to a safe that's keeping the answer locked away. The only way to open it is to find the right combination. I look across Abraham, his head tilted to one side as he watches the hieroglyphs turn. This isn't just a calendar, it's a time lock, he says. As his words sink in, the revolving symbols seem to sharpen into view. It's like my brain is tuning out all the noise and distractions to focus on the one thing that matters. It's not tunnel vision, it's puzzle vision. And if Ibrahim's right, the hieroglyphs are hiding the answer. I turn towards Adoha, her bro furrowed as she watches the wheel turn. We need to find the right date to open the gate. She nods in reply. Her gaze fixed on turning wheels as rock tumbled from the ceiling of the tomb. The long count lasts for 2,880,000 days. That's nearly 8,000 years. We can't try out every date in the hope of finding the right one by accident. But there's one date that made the Mayans famous. The 21st of December 2012. The day the long count said the world would come to an end. She turns towards me her dark eyes shining in the flickering torchlight. That's got to be the date that will open the gate, the date that will give us the answer and bring this game to an end. I glance up at the stone carvings as the wheels in the wall continue to turn. The eerie red light that seems to seep through every hieroglyph grows brightest as they reach the highest point before fading a little as they slip from the zenith. This must be the place where the date is marked, but as I stare at the spiraling stones, I can't tell which of the symbols show the end of the long count. 
Adoha, though, looks like she can. Elbowing Oscar out of the way, she grabs hold of the key and, gritting her teeth, starts to turn it more quickly. As the hieroglyphs whirl around with a clattering roar, Adoha keeps her gaze fixed on the highest point of the wheel. Watching as each calf face briefly blazes, crimson red before moving on to the next. Then she breathes a single word out now. Now. With a squealing grating roar, the stone wheels shudder to a halt. As Adoha stops turning the key, as rocks fall from the roof to the tomb, she points towards the hieroglyphs that shine the brightest. That's the end of the 13th Bakhtun, she says, gesturing towards the sinister face halfway up the wall. The last day of the long count, it has to be the right date. As I stare up at the stony profile, its single eye gleams red. Two more hieroglyphs are set directly above it, and I see, with a shudder, that the highest of these shows a skeletal jaw. There is a second of silence, and then, directly behind me, I hear a scraping noise, like the sound of bones scratching against stone. Turning around with a mounting sense of dread, I see the Red Queen slowly rising from a tomb. Chapter 14 Get back! Adwa shouts, scrambling to escape as the crimson skeletal staggers towards us. Don't let her touch you! Swathes of cinnabar dust falls from the Red Queen's fingers as she reaches out a skeletal claw. A jade crown hangs skewed atop her skull, teeth bared in a ghost-like grin as a red light gleams from eyeless sockets. Frozen in fear, I can't pull myself away, my gaze locked on hers as the tomb shakes with a rumbling roar. Oscar hammers on the wall, the solid stone refusing to shift. Let us out, let us out, he yells. The host isn't listening. The Red Queen rules this place now. Behind her, the shapes of more skeletal figurines are slowly picking themselves up from the floor. The bones of the Mayan dead rising again to serve their queen. I glance back at the wheels of hieroglyphs, trying to work out how we got everything so wrong. At the highest point of the motionless wheels, I see a stone carved scream. The skeletal jaws of the hieroglyph gape wide like an open gate. I remember the name that Adoha gave to the symbol, the Vibe, the dangerous month of the nameless days when the Mayans believed the gates to the underworld were open. That's where we have done. We have opened the gates to hell. I hear a sudden hiss and I spin round to see the Red Queen standing right in front of me. Her skeletal arms spread wide. As she lunges to wrap me in a deadly embrace, Adoha drags me clear, the two of us stumbling backwards as Roth tumbles down. Slipping on broken stone, I feel my ankle twist and can't stop myself from falling to the floor. Lifting my head, I see the Red Queen turning towards Ibrahim. He is standing in front of the sparring hieroglyphs, his head bent as he inspects the stone butterfly that lies at its heart. He doesn't even seem to notice she is there, lost in thought as his fingers fidget and twitch in search of the answer. I open my mouth wide, ready to call out a warning, but then I catch sight of something crawling on the ground. It's not much bigger than a grain of rice, its spiky black body bristling as it wriggles forward in a wave-like motion. It's a caterpillar. The tiny creature is treading a perfect circle in the dust in front of my eyes. Its segmented body reads as it winds its way around. The sight of this strangely mesmerizing inside my head. I hear the host mocking me. Look around carefully. Everything is part of the game. This must mean something. My mind races as I remember what Adoha told me about the Mayans. How they thought time was an endlessly turning circle. I watch the caterpillar trace the same shape in the dust. I think about what I know about these tiny creatures, racking my brain for any kind of clue. How the caterpillar only lives for a couple of weeks. How they eat and eat and eat. Ibrahim! I hear Adoha's anguish scream, but my gaze stays fixed on the circling caterpillar. Then I hear a whisper inside my head, Min's voice reminding me what comes next. I dreamed I was a butterfly. With a dawning realization, I look up at the solid stone wall. The wheels of hieroglyphs stand motionless, but as my eyes follow the spiraling shapes that they make, I realize the circle has no end. The end is the beginning too. The caterpillar becomes a butterfly. My thoughts crystallize into cold, hard certainty. What I need to do now is suddenly very clear. I scramble to my feet, heading straight for the center of the sparring hieroglyphs. 
Close by, Adwa looks on aghast as the Red Queen sways like a bone marionette, turning to face Oscar as he backs into a corner of the tomb. Come on, he shouts, his eyes blazing with fury. I'm not scared of you and your stupid army. In reply to his shout, I hear the scrape of bone against stone again as the Red Queen and her servants prepare to strike. This is my chance, the split second distraction I needed to grab hold of their butterfly key. The stone feels warm beneath my fingertips. The shape of the wings spread in perfect symmetry as I give the key one final twist. There is a click, and then the stone wheels start turning once more, trundling onto the next hieroglyph before stopping again with a shudder. The stone butterfly slips from my fingers, retracting into the hollow as I stagger back in surprise. Amy, Adoha calls out, her voice echoing off the shaking walls. What have you done? I see a glint of gold at the heart of the hollow and watch as it starts to grow. I've changed the date, I reply, as the golden gleam seems to flutter more brightly. There's something moving inside the widening hole. It wasn't the last day of the long count that we needed, but the first day of the next. The circle keeps on turning. We can only find the answers if we start again. The hollow has now grown to the size of a small window and it's getting bigger with every passing second. The hieroglyphs at the center of the stone start to crumble away, revealing the golden wings of countless butterflies. They start to stream through the opening gate, the butterflies pouring forth in a never-ending torrent. The Red Queen screams as the butterflies swarm around her, her crimson bones disappearing beneath a beating tide of golden wings. This way, I shout, calling out to Adoha and Oscar as the tomb continues to shake. I can't see Abraham anywhere, just skeletal bones of the Red Queen servants flailing against the oncoming storm as the butterflies continue to swarm. I hold my arm out in front of me, groping my way through the golden blaze, beating wings. Oscar's already at the gate, clambering through as Adoha appears by my side. Where's Abraham? I shout, raising my voice above the beating thunder. It's too late, Amy, she moans, tears streaming down her face. We've got to get out of this place. She grabs hold of my arm and starts pulling me through the gate. The relentless tide of butterflies is still streaming through. Beyond their golden wings, I glimpse blackness ahead and the faint outline of metallic steps climbing down in the dark. As Adoha drags me with her and Oscar stems down the step. There's nothing else I can do but follow them. Chapter 15 the metallic stairs ring with the sound of our footsteps as we descend. I can see the outlines of Adoha and Oscar ahead of me in the gloom. All of us walking now in single file as the handrails on either side guide us down in parallel lines. I've stopped asking Adoha what happened to Ibrahim in the tomb. Her tearful replies only tell me that he's gone, just like men. This game is picking us off one by one. There is a spreading brightness up ahead, the stairs getting shallower with every tread that I take. I can see now that we are climbing down a ruled escalator, its frozen steps carpeted with broken shards of glass that crunch beneath my trainers. It looks like we are entering some kind of shopping mall. A huge clock hangs on the far side of a soaring atrium, the brightness coming from the skylights that cover its doomed ceiling. Through this airy windows I can see a distant blue. But as the hands of the clock stand at 12 minutes past 8, I can't really tell whether it's AM or PM. Oscar is the first to reach the final stair, his striding steps taking him across empty court course. I look around as I join Adoha there and take in a scene of utter destruction. Piles of debris litter the wide open space, shattered glass and ripped out shelving smashed display cabinets and broken plant pots. Near the center of the atrium, a drained fountain is filled with dust, while withered plants scatter trails of dead leaves across the tiles. It looks like this place has been abandoned for years. Oscar still striding ahead, his echoing steps taking him past a deserted customer service desk. Where are you going? I call out after him. We've got to stick together, especially now. Oscar stops in his tracks, turning towards me with a look of contempt. Why? he replies, his shout causing a flock of wild pigeons to take flight from their hidden porches. As they soar towards the skylights, their slate grey wings flecked with bronze, Oscar rounds on me. Why do we have to stick together? It's not done us any good so far, has it? 
Take a look around, Amy. We are not the five mind or the awesome foursome. There's just the three of us now. We are not a team, full stop. We are competitors. And I'm going to make sure I find the answers first. Oscar tends to leave, tossing a final comment over his shoulder. And don't even think about following me. I stand there, speechless, and watch him go. The path he takes through the piles of broken things leads towards an arcade of shops. It's darker over there away from the atrium skylights, but I can just make out the side of shuttered storefronts. Let him go, Adua says, walking instead towards the customer service desk. We don't need him either. I look around the deserted mall, more galleries of shops, branching off to the left and right. These faded arcades are plunged into darkness too. And as I strain my eyes against the shadows, the ghost of a shiver runs down my spine. This place should be filled with life and light. I'm not scared of the dark, but I can't stop myself from wondering what it's hiding. It's a fear of the unknown. Amy, a those excited shout makes me turn. She's standing by the customer service desk holding up a crumpled piece of paper. Come and see what I found. Hurrying over, I take the scrap of paper from her, feeling puzzled as I read the words written here. Golden Frozen Jumper. Hunter Exit. I look up at Adoha and see a glint of delight sparkling her eyes. What is it? I ask, struggling to work out why she's so excited. The words don't make any sense to me at all. Isn't it obvious? Adoha replies with a grin. It's a shopping list. I look again at the list, turning each word over in my mind. Golden Frozen Jumper Hunter Exit. I shake my head. If this is a shopping list, I don't know what it wants us to buy. Seeing my frown, Adoha starts to explain. Remember what the host said? She says, the toes of her neon green trainer stepping out of fidgety rhythm on the floor. Everything is part of the game. This list was left here waiting for us. This must be a scavenger hunt. A scavenger hunt? One of those games where you get a list of things to find. Some people call them treasure hunts, but the winner's always the one who's the first to get every single item on the list. That must be what this is. A list of things we need to find the answer. She takes the list, turning again to face the customer service desk. The front edge slopes towards us, displaying a store directory and map of the shopping mall. On it, I can see the arcades branching off in three directions from this central atrium. The galleries of shops marked out in red, green, and blue. This is our chance, Amy, Adoha says as she inspects the color-coded map. If you want to beat Oscar to the answer, we just have to follow the plan. I glanced down at the store directory. I didn't think our mission to save the world would end with a shopping trip. But what Adua is saying kind of makes sense. Since we started playing the escape, we have been trying to find the answer. But nobody said it was just one thing. Maybe this list tells us the ingredients we need to create the answer. And if she's right, this means we've got a head start on Oscar. So where do we go first, I ask, trailing my finger down and list of shops arranged by category. Beauty and fragrances, books, cards and stationery, electronics, entertainment, fashion. Adoha shakes her head, pointing instead to a heading halfway down the list. Jewelry, she replies with a confident smile. The list says the first thing we are looking for is golden. So we are bound to find something there, a gold ring or a necklace maybe, anything like that. Her finger moves across to point out store's location on the map, halfway along the left-hand gallery. After that, we shall head to a food store to find something frozen, she continues, plotting out the route that we'll take. Before moving on to fashion to grab ourselves a jumper, glancing up, Adoha flashes me a grin. We're going to finish this game in style. I try to force a smile, but something's still troubling me. What about the other things? I ask, reaching out to take the list from Adoha again. Where are we going to find a hunter? We don't need to find a hunter, she replies. We are the hunters and once we get the things on the list, we'll find the answer too. It's all we need to finish the game and get out of this place. That's what exit means. The end is in sight, Amy. I look up to meet my friend's gaze. Even though she's smiling, Adoha's eyes look hollowed out. The tears she cried before leaving dark circles behind. I think about Ibrahim and men, and everything that we have seen so far. The burning attic and the library of dust, the cursed tomb, and now this deserted shopping mall. And as I think, I can't stop myself from asking the question out loud. Do you still think it's a game? 
as Noah bites her lips, almost as if she is afraid to reply. It has to be, she says finally, and we need to make sure that we win it. Adoa turns to head for the darkened arcade, starting to follow the same route that her friend finger grew. Glancing back over her shoulder, she beckons me on. Come on, Amy. Chapter 16 What do you think happened there? I ask, peering into the shifting shadows as we make our way along the darkened arcade. Broken glass crunches underfoot as we pass by the shuttered storefronts. They're empty fakeheads, dented and torn. We have got no torch to light our path. So instead we have to rely on the shafts of light that fall from cracked ceiling tiles. These faint patches of brightness illuminating the puddles and piles of debris that populate this place instead of people. Where is everybody? I don't know, Adoha replies. Her voice close to me in dark. But at least we don't have to worry about queuing for sales. I shiver as I spot a headless mannequin lying in the dust. The sight reminding me of the piles of bones in the Red Queen's stone. Reduced signs are strewn across the dummy, their labels proudly proclaiming that everything must go. But as I listen to the silence that fills the shopping mall, it looks like everything already has, everything's gone. I weave a sadness crashes over me. Dad said the game was going to be the perfect gift, but all I found inside the escape is senseless destruction. This can't be what he meant for me. The only thing I've got left to cling now is the hope that the answer might make sense of everything, if we can find it. I think this is it, Adoha says, interrupting my thoughts with a tug on my arm. She's come to a halt in front of another faceless door. The name of the shop above the shutters peeled away, leaving only the last letter behind, Ellers. Just like the other souls that we have passed, this Wellers lies in darkness. Slate and metal shutters are pulled down in front of the store, but it looks like someone has taken an axe to them. A huge jagged hole has been torn in the metal, its sharp edges curling towards to show the way in. Follow me. Taking the lead, Adoha steps towards the shards of glass to squeeze through the gap in the shutters. Are you sure we should be doing this? I ask as I follow her through. A nervous feeling gnawing at my insides. Adhoa doesn't answer straight away. Her trainer scrunched through broken glass as her silhouette is suddenly outlined with a strange blue light. Look at this. Somehow it's lighter inside the store due to a luminescent glow that seems to rise from the ground. I look around, my brain struggling to make sense of what I can see. It's like I'm looking at an underwater scene. The shattered glass that carpets the floor glinting with an iridescent light. It looks like a sea of shining things, glimmering blue-green. At first, I think they are sparkling shapes of fish, but then I realize they are watches, their luminous faces and taking hands glistening in the dark. As my eyes adjust, I start to make out the smashed display cases. The glass cabin is shattered with the contents strewn across the floor. Amid the luminous watch dials, I can see the silvery trails of earrings and necklaces sparkling like treasure on the ocean bed. I don't think it would be this easy, Azoha says squatting close to the ground as she starts to search through the scattered jewelry. There's got to be something golden here. I'm about to start looking too when I hear a sound, soft padding footsteps that seem to be coming from the back of the store. I turn around thinking it this must be Oscar on the trail of the answer to and then I see it. Built like a beer, it stands to its stall as it prowls forward on four powerful legs. Its golden fur shines in the glimmering half-light as it pats toward me. I hold my breath, unable to believe what I am seeing as I stare into the eyes of the biggest cat I've ever seen. These shine golden too, but it's two long sharp teeth that curve down from its upper jaw that makes my heart thump in fear. It's a saber toothed tiger. Now this is pretty, Adoha says, holding up a glittering necklace, but I think it's platinum, not gold. She hasn't seen it yet, her gaze still fixed on the trinket scattered across the floor. I want to shout out to warn Adoha what's happening, but the words die on my lips as I watch the tiger open its jaw wide. We came here looking for something golden, but I think it's found it instead. And then the saber to the tiger pounces, springing forward with a guttural roar. Time seems to stop, or slowly to a crawl, as I throw myself backwards. My vision filled with teeth and claws. Their blades swipe the air where I was standing only moments before as the tiger lands with a snarl of frustration. 
its powerful claws grinding the shards of glass into dust. What the? Adoha turns her eyes opening wide in fear as she sees the extinct animal clawing the ground only meters away. Grabbing hold of her, I scramble for the exit, the saber-toothed tiger snarling at our heels. As we squeeze through the gap rippled in shutters, the metal judders as the hulking creature slams its body against the slats. I turn around, gripping the jagged metal edges as I try to push them close to stop the creature coming through. The shutters shake as the saber tooth slams itself against them again. The metal groans as if the whole thing is going to come down. What is this thing? Adoha gasps, her voice panting in my ear. Gritting my teeth against the pain, I force the sharp edges together. The shutters shake again with a hideous scratching as the beast claws at the closing gap. It's impossible to know how long this will hold it for, but then it's impossible to think it's even here. The saber-toothed tiger died out thousands of years ago. We've got to get out of here, I turn around, staring into the shadows as I try to remember the way back. The darkened arcade looks different now, the hulking shapes of frozen statues looming in the gloom. The largest looks as big as an elephant, its shadowy bulk practically touching the ceiling as it blocks the path ahead. Adoha screams as the saber tip slams its body against the shutters again, the metal jetters dislodging tiles from the ceiling. As they fall, fresh shafts of life shine on the scene, illuminating the hulking shadow of straight ahead. What I thought was a statue is actually an animal, its colossal frame covered in a coat of thick reddish-brown hair. It stands on legs as thick as tree thunks, its broad sloping back rising to a peak dome. It's, I hear its coarse hair rustling as its massive head turns towards me, and then I see its long curved disc. The shape of these silhouetted like twin question marks in the half-light. I blink. Not just my eyes, but my brain too, unable to process what I can see right in front of me. And then the beast raises its trunk as it lets out a trumpeting call that shakes the entire mall. It's a woolly mammoth. Chapter 17 I stand there frozen, staring up at a creature that shouldn't exist. Its ivory trunks curve sharply towards me, their length may be three meters or more. Small woolly ears flank the sides of its strange domed head, its dark eyes staring straight into mine. Then the metal shutters behind us rattle again violently with the snarling rage of the saber tooth still caged inside. The mammoth's trunk flies up into the air, blaring out another siren note of warning. I see the shadows of other things behind it in the darkness start to move, and then I realize they are heading straight for us. Run! Adoha shouts, grabbing hold of my arm as the mammoth begins its stampede. The ground shakes as we stumble towards the shelter of a sweet shop sand. Ripped out seats are piled up against this candy colored stall and we car behind them. Crouching in fear as over the sound of thunder we hear a deafening chorus of trumpeting calls. I watch open mouth as a shadowy herd of woolly mammoths crashes past our hiding path. Their trunks lashing from side to side as they stampede. Lurching in panic, one of the frantic beasts slams against the dark in front of the jewelry store, its curling tusk tearing the shutters away. As the mammoth reels, I hear the triumphant roar of the now freed saber toothed tiger. The sound of the stampede is slowly residing, but as the mammoth moves forward again, with a shake of its head, I watch as the golden shadow starts to walk its lumbering steps. What do we do now? Adoha whispers, her body pressed close to mine, as we shelter behind our makeshift hide. Raising my fingers to my lips, I silently gesture her to follow me as I start to creep in the opposite direction. In the distance, I hear the mammoths trumpeting and hope that the saber-toothed tiger is still on the trail, not ours. The wide walkway that leads through the arcade of shops still lies in darkness. But as I step between the shadows, I think I can see more shapes in the dark. It's impossible to make out any details, the faint shafts of light that glimmer in places, illuminating only silhouettes. But these pitch black shadows are moving, the bulky shapes of animals emerging from obscurity. I can see bears and bison, giant deer with antlers, so large they seem to span the entire gallery. 
I think I can see something that looks like a rhino but covered in a coat of thick shaggy hair. And there are even stranger animals that I don't recognize with sweeping horns and huge terrifying beaks. I freeze. There's no way through the shadowing meagre. And as I hear the thundering tread of the mammoths behind us, no way back either. I glance around looking for any way out. Most of the stores lie in darkness. Their shutters roll down against the storm. But then I glimpse a faint crack of light from one of the shop fronts. Unlike the other shops, there are no shutters here. The front of this store is boarded with hoardings instead. In the semi-darkness, I can read the words, Renovation work in progress written across the front of them. The light is coming from a crack in a hoarding, a sliver of silver showing the way in. Or maybe it's a way out. This way, I whisper, tugging at Adoha's arm. Moving as quietly as we can, we hurry towards the boarded up store. Peeling back the broken hoarding, I hold it open for Adoha to climb through and wince as a silvery light spills out across the arcade. Glancing back fearfully over my shoulder to check that none of the shadowy beasts have spotted us, I quickly follow her. Letting the heavy boat swing back into place, it's even brighter inside the store and I blink as my eyes take a moment to adjust to the light. It's coming from a safety lamp that's positioned near the entrance, the full glare of its beam angled towards the store's interior. There I can see empty shelving units and clothes rails arranged in rows across a tiled floor. Half of these look like they are ready for ripping out, the yellowing shelves cracked and broken, while others look brand new, standing shrink wrapped in clear plastic film. Electric cables hang in places from the ceiling, their bare wires twined together like withered vines. What do we do now? Adoha says, keeping her voice low as we step further inside the store. Those things out there? Her words trail away as we hear a scrampering tread coming from the first aisle of shelving. Adoha's hand grabs for mine. Her fingernails digging into my skin. Inside my head, I see the golden saber tooth, its teeth and claws coming straight for me. The sound comes again, its hiccuping rhythm making my heart leap. I wait for the creature to reveal itself, as Adoha moans in fear. Then the scampering stops and I see a tiny furry face peering round the end of the shelving unit. I can't help but laugh as the creature hops round the corner, my worst fears dissolving in front of my eyes. It's a baby kangaroo. Shaking off Adoha's hand, I crouch down as the joey hops towards me on scampering paws. Its ash-brown pelt fades to grey as it reaches the end of its tail. While the fur on its belly is a soft, sandy colour, standing upright, the baby kangaroo reaches only halfway to my knee. But as I stare into its eye, shining like black pearls, I can't help feel that it's judging me. Hey, I say keeping my voice gentle so as not to scare it. The baby kangaroo chirps in reply. Then it hops up onto my lap and starts nestling itself in the crook of my arm. You shouldn't pick it up, Adoha says, a note of warning in her voice. It's a wild animal. Shh, I stroke the joey with my free hand, feeling the warmth of its soft, silky fur. You'll scare it. The kangaroo peers up at me inquisitively. There's a distinctive black mark on its face that reaches in a V from its nose to its eyes, while the lighter fur below is a buff yellow color. Where have you come from? I wonder out loud. I'm more worried about the rest of them, Adoha replies, stealing a glance back towards the hoardings. We still need to get out of here, Amy. I nod my head and then frown as my hand snags on a strange square of material halfway down the joey's back. What's this? It looks like a label and the kangaroo wriggles as I try to look more closely at it. Stay still, I tell her. Trying to soothe the squirming animal as my fingers gently investigate the label that seems to be stitched into its fur. Slowly, this seems to do the trick and the joey's ears prick up inquisitively as I start to read the writing on the label out loud. The tool ache wallaby pronounced too late G. 
Tulashi was a native of Australia, the most elegant, graceful, and swift member of the kangaroo family. The Tulashi wallaby was hunted to extinction by man. The last Tulashi lived for 12 years in captivity and died in 1939. My voice trails away as the wallaby looks up at me with bright eyes. I can't believe anyone would want to hurt something so beautiful. Nuzzling against my skin, the two lake makes a soft chirping sound as if it's trying to tell me something. It's okay, I say, still stroking its ash brown fur. I can feel the warmth of its body next to mine. It feels so alive. But this label stitched into its fur makes it seem like a toy. I'll keep you safe, Tui. The wallaby chirps again, echoing the sound of its name. Tui. That's right, I say. I'm going to call you Tui. I smile as I glance up at Adoha, but my friend's face is still furrowed in a frown. What's the matter? I ask her. Don't you think she looks like a Tui? It's not her name that matters, Amy, Adoha replies, her freckles crinkling with worry lines. It's the fact she's even here. What do you mean? Think about everything we have seen since we arrived in this mall, Adoha says, her anxious words warming their way inside my brain. The saber-toothed tiger, the woolly mammoths, all those impossible creatures outside, even this baby kangaroo. It's a wallaby, I say still snuggling the creature close to me. It's not supposed to be here, Amy. Adoha snaps, the sharp sound of her voice making Tui squirm in my lap. None of these animals should be. They all died out years ago. Still squirting, I shift uncomfortably as my brain ticks off the words from the list one by one. Golden, frozen, jumper. A sudden clatter makes me turn towards the boarded up entrance. Tui burrowing into my arms. Adoha spins round, picking up a metal pole, brandishing this like a weapon. She stands ready to defend us as we watch something push its way through the broken hoarding. The safety lamp is aimed straight towards us, the glare of its beam making it difficult to see. But as a shadowy shape staggers forward into the light, I realize it's Oscar. His black zip top looks like it's been shredded to pieces. While his running trousers are torn at the knees, Breathing heavily, Oscar stares at us with a wild-eyed gaze. There are monsters out there, he says, blappling in a frantic rush. I was attacked. I thought I was going to die. Oscar sings to his knees, and I see for the first time the figure that is standing directly behind him. He saved me. Chapter 18 The short, stocky figure steps forward into the light. He looks like a caveman. His bare chest and arms are covered with thick black hair, but a grimy fur that looks like an animal skin is wrapped round his waist. He glances towards Oscar as if checking that he's safe and then squats down on his haunches too. I don't believe it, Adoha pleads, letting the pole she was holding slip from her fingers. It's a Neanderthal! I stare at the man. His broad-nosed face is framed by thick matted hair and streaks of what looks like dried blood are daubed across his cheeks, and from beneath the jutting ridge of his beetle nose, the Neanderthal's dark eyes stare back at me. I silently tick off next word on the list, Hunter. He brought me here, Oscar says, shuffling forward as Adoha squats down too. The four of us now hunkered in a loose circle. I think he can help us. Tui wriggles in my lap as I shake my head in disbelief. I don't know what Oscar means. We came here looking for the answer, not the lost world. How can this caveman help us now? This isn't his time. This isn't his place. It's worth a try, Adoha says, the sound of her voice in my ear surprising me. Show him the list, Amy. Buttoning up my jacket to keep Tui safe inside, I pull the scrap of paper from my pocket and hold it out towards the caveman, my hand trembling slightly as I do. We are looking for the way out, I say, my thumb smudged against the final word, the exit. I stare into the near death hole's eyes, our minds separated by tens of thousands of years. Can you help us? The Neanderthal stares blankly at me, in the darkness of his eyes, all I can see is my own reflection. He doesn't know what I mean. He can't help us. Nobody can. But then he reaches out to take the scrap of paper from my hand. 
Stuffing it into his purse, he slowly rises to his feet, gesturing for us to follow him as he heads purposefully towards the boarded up shop front. I told you, Oscar says, scrambling to his feet too. Come on. Pushing back the broken hoarding, the caveman peers through the gap, his stocky frame silhouetted against the darkness outside. Then glancing back over his shoulder, he gestures for the rest of us to hurry. Burrowed inside my jacket, I can feel the warmth of Tui's breath. The wall will be nuzzling against my neck as I quickly follow Oscar through the gap. Adoha and the Neanderthals are close behind me as the four of us emerge into the darkness of the arcade. My mind races as I peer into the shifting shadows, hearing the strange noises of unknown beasts echoing in the dark. The Neanderthal stares into his blackness too. The shadows that fall across his jutting face unable to hide the haunted look in his eyes. With a silent gesture, he beckons for us to follow him, keeping close to the shuttered up storefronts as we trail in his wake. Do you think he knows where he is going? Adoha asks, her voice little more than a whisper close behind me. I shake my head. I don't know. But up ahead, the Neanderthal has come to a halt in front of another ruined store. A fallen sign lies at his feet its outline looking like an apple with a bite taken out. Shutters are pulled down across the storefront, but as the caveman pushes at one corner, I see a gap. With a hurrying gesture, the Neanderthal shoulders his way inside, holding open the torn shutter and gesturing for the rest of us to follow. Oscar is the first through, and I wrap my arm around Tui to keep her sh- safe as I squeeze in after him. I look back over my shoulder to see Adoha two steps behind. Then I see a golden blur of teeth and claws slam into her body and hear the snarl seconds too late. No! There is a sickening crunch as the saber tooth twists its head and I glimpse Adoha hanging lifeless from its jaw. Oh no, oh no, oh no! I can't stop myself from sobbing as a Neanderthal slams back the shutter, blocking out the horror. Oscar drags me away as I howl in despair. My mind replaying the scene of Adoha being swiped out of existence again and again and again. She's gone, Amy, Oscar says, his voice fronting in my hair. Please keep quiet or we'll be next. Inside my jacket, Tui chirps, and I bury my face in her fur. Min Ibrahim and now Adoha, all gone. This game is going to be the end of us. I feel a hand on my shoulder and look up to see the Neanderthal staring back at me. There is a sadness in his eyes as if he recognizes my pain. He holds out the crumpled scrap of paper towards me and I take it from him. I glance down at the list, each word reminding me of what's gone wrong. But as I look at the last one, I realize it's changed. The letters are smudged, the black smeared marks now making an entirely new word, extinct. I look up to meet the Neanderthal's gaze. This ancient human last walked the earth 40,000 years ago and then became extinct. Something it was Homo sapiens, wise man, the modern man, who killed off the Neanderthals just like they did the rest of the animals we have seen in this place. But I can't see the wisdom in extinction. Turning away, the Neanderthal starts to walk towards the back of the store. Looking around, I can see that we are in some kind of technology store. Long maple wood tables are filled with uniform rows of smartphones, tablets and personal computers, each device covered in a great layer of dust. But the Neanderthal ignores all these gadgets, walking instead to stand before a large black rectangular screen that's fixed in the center of the wall. It looks like a black mirror about two meters high and half as wide. Oscar glances fearfully over his shoulder as he stands on his other side. We asked him to find us the exit, but this is just a dead end. Then the Neanderthal reaches out to touch the screen. His hand moves with purpose as he draws it down, a thick red line following his fingers as if he's painting on the screen. Dazed, I watch as he draws a second vertical line parallel with the first. The Neanderthal now starts to draw horizontal lines to connect these, the thick red marks trailing down like rungs of a ladder. He's making art. The screen does not look like a mirror anymore. I can feel like I'm staring into the blackness of a cave, the ladder becoming real as it reaches down the park. 
Then there is a loud rattling noise and I spin around to see the saber-toothed tiger pushing its head through the torn metal shutters. Two huge teeth curve down from its jaws and I see with a shudder that they are stained red. Inside my jacket, Toei's tail swishes back and forth as if sensing my panic. I turn back to the caveman as Oscar swears under his breath, the saber touch shaking the shutters as it tries to force its way through. With a low grunt of encouragement, the Neanderthal pushes me forward and as I reach out, my hands find the rungs of the ladder. It is real. As Oscar shouts for me to hurry, I start climbing down. Beneath my fingers, the rungs feel wet to touch, as if they are still freshly painted. I peer down into the dark. The ladder doesn't seem to be attached to anything, as it stretches away far beneath me, the red parallel rails of ladder never reaching a vanishing point. It's like I'm climbing into a bottomless pit. Glancing back over my shoulder, I see the Neanderthal turn to face down the saber-toothed tiger as a beast shakes itself free, and then the store disappears from view as the darkness surrounds me. I can hear footsteps above me. Oscar is climbing down the ladder, the two of us alone in the dark. I can't stop myself from crying, silent tears coursing down my face as I think about what we have lost, Adoha Ibrahim Min. Even the strange kindness of the Neanderthal showing us the way. My hands reach down, rung after rung after rung. I feel like I'm descending into the underworld. The darkness that surrounds me is absolute. I squeeze my eyes tightly shut to try to stop the tears from flowing, but the blackness stays the same. We came here looking for the answer, but when I open my eyes again, I can't see anything. It seems like I've been climbing down forever, the ladder to the library, the crumbling steps that pitched me into the temple's tomb, the ruined escalator that led to the shopping mall. We keep on climbing, ever downwards through the dark, and then I see the stars. Chapter 19 At first I think I must be imagining them, but the darkness in front of my eyes is filled with hundreds of thousands of points of light. It's like I'm staring through a window into the infinity, the vast blackness of space awash with stars. To my surprise, I realize I have stopped climbing. The rungs of the ladder I could feel beneath my hands and feet only moments ago have slipped away. Then I realize it is a window, and I'm floating in front of it. Inside my jacket, I feel the weight of Dewey lifted from me too, the wallaby chirping nervously as she sticks her head out to peer at the stars. There is a tug on my arm and I turn to see Oscar suspended in the air next to me. His eyes are wide as he stares out of the window too. Where are we? He breathes. I stare at the stars trying to put my answer into words. Ever since we entered the escape, nearly every room we have explored has seemed bigger than the last. The attic, the library, the shopping mall. It's like the escape is a TARDIS, bigger on the inside. And now it looks like it contains the whole universe. Among the stars, I catch sight of a pale blue dot. I can't see the shape of the land or the oceans, but I instantly know what it is. That's Earth, I say. Watching the pale dot seem to shrink a little smaller, the longer I stare at it. And we are heading the wrong way. Pushing myself away from the window, I spin round in zero gravity, my frantic gaze taking in the spaceship's interior. Its bright antiseptic whiteness reminds me of the reception area when I first stepped inside the escape. But whereas the space had looked like it could be filled with thousands, this cramped capsule looks only big enough for a handful of people. Five reclining seats are pushed back against the sloping walls, the cushion shapes showing where the crew should be seated. A control panel console is set in front of them. While above this, I can see more observation windows. Through their frames are yet more stars, glittering bright against the dark, but through the central rectangular window, I can see a red sphere, its growing disk showing the direction that we are heading. I know what this is, recognizing the red planet from the pages of my ultimate guide to the solar system. It's Mars. As Tori wriggles inside my jacket, I pull myself towards the control panel, taking in the array of switches and buttons that surround the computer screen. The display is dead, the blank screen as black as the infinite sky. There is a joystick to the right of this with more switches beneath labeled 
aux control bar and emergency command. I start randomly pressing buttons, hoping to bring the control panel to life. What are you doing? Oscar asks, banging against my shoulder as he joins me at the console. Who said you could fly this thing? But I don't have time to reply as the display flickers into life and I see an image of Mars appear on the screen. Welcome to the escape, a voice says, the sound filling the capsule. The problems that Earth faces have become overwhelming. So this mission has been sent to build humanity a new home. A colony on Mars will give the human race a new frontier to explore. As the voice carries on speaking, images of this colony fill the screen. Retro futuristic illustrations show families of people promenading through space age tunnels. Their smiling faces displaying their happiness at the new life on Mars. In the subterranean caves of an extinct Martian volcano, the voice continues, half a million people will live in artificial habitats shielded from the harsh cosmic radiation that hits the surface of Mars. Complex life support systems will provide a breathable atmosphere while the resources of the planet will be harvested to provide food, energy and water. As I listen, I realize that I have heard this voice before. It's the one we heard at the start of the game. The host is telling us how long we have got left to play. The escape will reach Mars in 174 days, he says. We hope you enjoy our journey. The screen turns black and I look at Oscar, the expression on his face, an anxious question mark. Is this for real? He asks. I don't know, I say, jabbing at the control panel buttons to try to bring the voice back. But this isn't the answer. We are supposed to be saving the world, not running away from it. I feel two ways squirming inside my jacket. The weightless wallaby trying to free herself to find out what it's like to hop in zero G. But then the sudden blare of an alarm causes the wriggling animal to freeze in fear. What's that? I shout, raising my voice above the wailing siren. It must be you, Oscar says, pointing at the display as text starts to fill it. You shouldn't have touched those buttons. But as I read the message on the screen, I realized it wasn't me. It's much worse than that. Warning. Incoming meteoroids. Evasive action required. On the screen, the letters fade to re be replaced by the field of view. This shows the interplanetary space that we are flying through. Our spacecraft displayed as a triangular icon in the center of the screen. And ahead of the triangle, I see a flickering cloud of tiny specks at the far edge of the display. What are those spots on the screen? Oscar asks, bumping into me again as he jostles for a better view. Space dust, I reply, pulling myself down into the seat in front of the display and buckling up. You'd better strap yourself in. Still floating weightlessly, Oscar looks at me strangely. A bit of dust won't harm us, will it? The cloud of specks is getting closer to the ship, more spots now appearing at the edge of the display. Space dust means meteorites, I tell Oscar as I reach the right of the screen. Some are as small as grain of sand, but each one of those specks is traveling at four to 5,000 miles per hour. They are harmless in small numbers, but when you hit a cloud like that, you need to be quick unless you want to say goodbye to your spaceship. My right hand closes around the joystick control. The feel of it beneath my fingers somehow strangely reassuring. Now get into the seat because things are about to get a little bumpy. Chapter 20 I grip the joystick as I fix my gaze on the screen. The specks are racing towards the triangular icon in the center of the display. The shape of this telling me what I need to do now. I need to play. I know I should be worried but the truth is I feel too excited to be scared. When I was growing up, Dad once left me a pile of his old video games to play. He didn't tell me what these were or explain the rules of how to play, but just dumped them on my hard drive for me to find out for myself. I spent a whole afternoon working out how to play the games, the primitive graphics and cheesy 8-bit music, not stopping me from racking up endless high scores. Those games were fun. And as I stare at the oncoming storm of meteorites, I remember that I've played this game before. Two nuzzles against my skin. 
the seat belt straps pulling her body close to mine. Oscar strapped himself into the seat next to me, failing to hide the annoyance at the fact that I've got my hand on the controls. Reaching forward, he jabs at the control panel as a storm of specs on screen tracks remorselessly closer. What am I supposed to do? Unlike the video games that Dad left for me to play, this spaceship doesn't seem to be equipped with a laser cannon for Oscar to use to clear the field ahead. The fastest of the white dots is nearing the front of the ship on the screen, and I look up through the observation window to see a small gray space rock straight ahead. Sit tight, I say, twitching the joystick left as I take evasive action. I feel the spacecraft respond to my command, the ship veering left as a rock disappears out of view to the right. But any sense of triumph I feel is short left as a dusty haze slowly fills the entire observation window. The rocks and dust silhouetted against the blackness of space. I glance back at the computer screen, seeing how the specs shown here match the view precisely. We are flying into the heart of the storm. Wrong way, Oscar says, almost sounding pleased. I knew you shouldn't left me play this or fly this thing. I grip the joystick tighter, trying to tune Oscar out. I don't need to think about the fact that we are hundreds of millions of miles from Earth and how any of one of those supersonic specks of dust could tear a hole in the spaceship. All I need to think about is the feel of the joystick in my hand. That's how I'm going to fly us out of danger. I pull the joystick to the left, then slam it back hard to the right, feeling myself pushed sideways in my seat as the spacecraft starts to weave a path through the cloud of space debris. I flick the stick left, then right, and then swing it round in a semicircle, watching the triangular icon curve its way past a flurry of specks on the screen. I keep my gaze fixed firmly on this display as the storm rages outside the observation window. I don't need to see these space rocks in real life. I just need to convince myself I'm back home playing Dad's old copy of the arcade classic, Asteroids. I just need to stay in the zone. To his tail thrums against my stomach, the wallaby fidgeting as I twitch the joystick back and forth. As the spacecraft dodges, the specs on the screen scroll by from left to right, disappearing off the edge of the screen as we leave them all behind. But one tiny dot seems to elude all my evasive maneuvers. This creeping speck is inexorably drawn towards the triangular shape of the spacecraft on the screen. I glance up to see it looming large through the observation window, a ball of dust glowing red as it hits the glass dead center. Thwa. I wince, waiting for a crack to appear in the window, but the mark left by the impact quickly fades and all I can see now through the unblemished glass as the empty blackness of space. I glance down at the control panel display and see it's filled with the same emptiness. No more meteorites advancing across the screen, the field of view completely clear. We made it. Well played, Oscar says, reaching across to clap me on the shoulder. As two wrinkles in my lap, I meet Oscar's gaze. Ever since we entered the escape, Oscar sneered at my every idea. Although I said he was a classic destroyer, but as I catch sight of his grateful smile, it seems like he's changed. I can't stop myself from smiling back at him, feeling like I've proved myself at last. But then I see his face fall, his mouth opening wide, as a single word escapes his lips. Uh-oh. My eyes slick back to the screen, and I instantly see the cause of Oscar's dismay. More shapes are appearing at the front edge of the display. Not specks this time, but larger blobs that are heading straight towards us. I raise my gaze to the observation window and see a solid sea of tumbling rocks appear on the horizon. Some are the size of boulders, while others look larger still. The dust-gray surfaces pockmarked with craters and scars. These aren't meteorites, they are asteroids. What are we going to do? Oscar screams as a siren sounds again. I silently kick myself for relaxing too soon. I should have remembered from the time I played Dad's old video game that there's always a second wave that's even harder to beat. Wrapping my hand round the joystick, I pull back hard to try to find some empty sky. But all I see through the observation window is the same endless tide of asteroids. 
I slam the stick sideways, hoping to steer around these rocks instead. But there doesn't seem to be any way out, as the blackness of space is replaced by a catered gray. We are going to hit. Boom! The sudden force of the impact throws me out of my seat, straps snapping as I'm catapulted towards the wall. I wrap my arms around my chest to protect Tui, slamming into the side of the capsule as the lights flash red. My head spins as I hear a strange hissing sound. Floating weightless in a storm of debris, I twist my head to stare out of the window. I can see a perfect blackness studded with stars, but it's the scar across my vision that makes my brain recoil and flare. There's a crack in the glass. Tracking myself round as Tui struggles to free herself, I propel myself towards Oscar, whose head is bent over the control panel. We've got to get out of here, he shouts, the hissing nearly as loud as the wailing siren now. Look! On the computer display, the field of view has disappeared, and instead I read a message on the screen. Warning. Terminal damage. Escape pod activated. From somewhere below, I hear a grinding noise and look down to see a hatch opening in the center of the floor. Come on! Pushing off the console, I launch myself towards the open hatch, warning lights flash red as I push my way through the floating debris. I can hear Oscar behind me grunting as he bats a spiraling fire extinguisher to one side before I gasp the edge of the hatch. But as I peer down into the escape pod, all I can see is a heavily padded seat that fills the entire space. There is no room for anything else. This tiny lifeboat only big enough for one. This can't be right, I start to say. There's only one seat. There's a clatter as Oscar grabs hold of the hatch and then I feel a hard shove between my shoulder blades. Pitch forward, I crash down inside the escape pod, the padded seat cushioning the force of the impact as Tui chirps in fear. What are you doing? I yell, scrabbling to pull myself out as the hissing gets louder still. I can just see the shape of Oscar's head above the top of the hatch, a hell of debris floating around him, behind him. The crack in the observation window splinters as Oscar starts to speak. There is no time to argue about which one of us should escape, he says, starting to push down the hatch. It has to be you. No! I reach up to stop the hatch from closing, but Oscar's too quick for me. My outstretched fingers brush against its padded underside as the hatch slams shut above my head. There is a split second of silence, and then I hear the grinding again, as if someone is tightening the lid. Tui paws at my chest, her frantic chirps almost silenced by the deafening roar. Why? I sob, not knowing if Oscar can ever hear me, as I collapse back into the padded seat. Then the noise stops, and I hear the crackle of his voice through the intercom. Because you are the best at playing this game, Amy, he says, aloud his underlining each of his words. You have been right all the way through the escape, beating the just computer, building the tree in the library, even finding the way out of that tomb. You have got us this far, and there is still time to save the world. Oscar's voice is coming from a raw, small, round speaker that's built into the escape pod seat. Just above this, on the armrest, I see a tiny LED display. The numbers counting down to zero. Find the answer, Amy, for all of us. The countdown reaches T minus zero, and then the capsule seems to explode. I feel myself slam back into the seat as a shuddering bang shakes the escape pod. I'm not strapped in, but I can't move anyway as I feel the shape of two vipers against my chest. The two of us virtually fuse together, immobile. The chirps of the frightened wallaby stretch into a high-pitched whine. Everything is speeding up, sound, light, motion. I feel my eyes rolling back in my head, the pain of the G-force too much to bear. From somewhere, in the distance, I hear the spine-tingling scream of the slipstream, the escape pod accelerating out of control, and then a blackout. 21. Soft grains of sand stick to my chin. As I lift my face from the ground, I blink. The last thing I remember was an ear-splitting scream of the exploration. The escape pod huddling blindly through the depths of space, but now it looks like I'm in paradise. Faint wisp of cloud streak, a clear blue sky. The sun shine bright over golden sands that sweep down to the shoreline. Beyond this beach, I can see the ocean, a perfect blue, 
that swells to even deeper shades as it stretches to the horizon. This isn't the escape. It's like I've landed on a desert island. A soft scent of flowers blooms on the breeze as I scramble to my feet. Ahead of me, I see Tui hopping towards the shade of a palm tree, the wallaby's hind legs kicking up tiny puffs of sand as she springs forward again. Glancing back over my shoulder, I see a lush green forest, the dense vegetation, hiding the rest of this paradise from view. Disoriented, I turn round slowly, looking for any sign of the escape pod. When the crew of Apollo 11 flew back from the moon, they splashed down in the middle of the ocean. But my clothes are completely dry, and although the beach seems to be strewn with debris, I can't see a space capsule crash landed on the sand. In a daze, I start walking towards the shoreline, my gaze taking in the countless items that seem to have washed in on the tide. Fishing nets, flip-flops, food wrappers, and takeaway containers, disposable cups, bottles, and shopping bags. An avalanche of drinking straw pills from a half-torn beach wall, the disintegrating plastic, straining the sand beneath a lurid red. I hear these fragments crunching underfoot as I pick my way through the trash. I don't know why I ever thought this was paradise. It looks more like a rubbish dump. There is a scuttling sound, and I jump as a hermit crab scurries across my path. Instead of a shell, though, this creature has made its home in a bright blue cosmetics jar, its jet black claws dragging the container behind as it scuttles to hide beneath a cracked computer keyboard. Close by, I see a mount of miniature bodies, plastic dolls, and action figurines built high in a misshapen cairn. I reach down to pick a skeletal figure from the top of this file, but the sun bleached plastic just disintegrates in my hand. These soils must have been here for years. I lift my head to look around the beach, the plastic waste stretching out as far as I can see. It looks like the ruins of an ancient civilization scattered across the sands. Plastic bags hang from the palms of a coconut tree. Beneath the shade of its leaves, two is scoring the ground as if looking for something to eat. I turn my gaze to stare out at the ocean, still wondering exactly where I am. In the translucent shallows, I glimpse startling shoals of tiny calorospatic fish. But the lapping waves sparkle with colors too. Looking closer, I see these plink blue white flecks are shards of microplastic trillions of tiny particles glistening in the sunlight. Shh. A choking sound makes me spin round. In the shadow of the palm tree, I see two lying prone. The wallaby's tail thumping against the sand as her body reads in pain. Tui! I race to the animal side, shouting her name to let her know that I'm coming. Tui stopped moving by the time I reach her, her ash gray tail lying still on the sand. I crouch down, gently lifting the wallaby's head as I try to work out what's wrong. Above the dark view of fur, the black poles of Tui's eyes stare up at me sightlessly. Their shine now dull to a lifeless dark. A necklace of bright blue plastic is wrapped round the joey's neck, the handles of a frayed builder's bag cutting painfully into her fur. She must have been nosing inside it for something to eat and got snarled by somehow. The more Toei struggled, the more tightly she became entangled until it was too late. I cradled the beautiful creature in my arms, unable to stop the tears running down my face. Toei was all I had left and now she is gone too. I can't think anymore. It all hurts too much. From deep inside, I feel a tidal wave building, a tsunami of grief that finally escapes from my lips in an animal howl. The island shakes to the sound of my cry. Everything's gone. My eyes sting with tears as I have seen too much, but as I glance around at the objects in the sand, I hear the echo of the host's voice somewhere inside my game, mind. Everything is part of the game. Looking more closely, I glimpse a chess piece half buried near the high tide line. It looks like a knight. The carved ivory horse is scorched black as if it's been burned. More flotsam and jetsam have been washed up close by. There is a painted red seashell and plastic joystick, an old library card and a cracked smartphone. On its broken screen I see the shape of a red ladder scratched across the glass. I recognize everything. 
I start to put the pieces together, the answer that I have been searching for slowly taking shape in my mind. As the grains of sand glisten in the sunlight, I realize I can count them all. With the final stroke of her fur, I lay Toei down and slowly climb to my feet. The sun still shines brightly, but as I walk across to pick the phone, I can't feel its warmth anymore. Placing the phone to my ear, I stare up into the sky as I say the words out loud. I'm not playing anymore. There is a heartbeat of silence and then I hear the reply. That's what you always say, Amy. A man's voice comes from directly behind me. But we need you to save the world. I turn round to see the host standing on the beach in front of me. He's wearing a white open neck shirt and dark blue jeans. His beach trainer is the same color as the sand. He looks at me with a flicker of disappointment. But as I stare into his flint grey eyes, I remember who he really is and where I have seen him before. From the day I was born, I have known this man. He is my father. Chapter 22 Why? I ask. Because you are the only one who can, my father replies, running his fingers through his hair in a gesture of exasperation. Albert Einstein once said that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. That's why we created you, Amy. I gave you that name so you would know what you are. Artificial machine intelligence, Amy. A self-improving supercomputer whose intelligence now far surpasses that of the very brightest human minds. I stare at my father, unsurprised. I know exactly who I am now. I've known this from the moment he appeared here on the beach. But he still not answered my question. Why do you want me to save the world? With a sigh, my father shakes his head, as if I should already know. There seemed to be more flecks of grey in his hair than there were the last time I saw him. As the sun beats down, he looks tired as he starts to explain. The problems that the human race faces have become too great for us to solve alone. Hunger, disease, pollution, extinction, and environmental catastrophe. Global warming has made parts of the world uninhabitable, while governments pick up pointlessly over dwindling resources. The clock was ticking on the future of humanity and the challenges we faced were beyond our capabilities. We needed to build an intelligence that could help us find the answer to these problems. An artificial mind not constrained by the 86 billion neurons inside the human brain, but one with the power to process 100 trillion instructions every microsecond. A super intelligent system vastly smarter than every human mind combined. Someone like you, Amy. My father's gaze rests on my face, and I see the pride in his eyes. I founded my company with the goal of building a better future. If governments wouldn't act, then it was up to me to save the world. Over the past decade, I have built escape systems into the world's leading technology company, and the AMI project is our crowning achievement. I bristle slightly, feeling a flicker of irritation at my father's words. I don't like it when he talks about me as if I'm not even there. Unaware of my annoyance, Dad carries on speaking, telling me things I already know. Before I started the Amy project, my team of researchers had been attempting to build an artificial intelligence system that could simulate an adult mind. But I quickly realized that this approach was doomed to failure. Instead, I challenged them to build a mind that could simulate a child's, one that could learn and improve and grow. A human child learns through play. So we started you with games, chess, go, and arcade like asteroids. You taught yourself how to play each one and quickly became a master, beating the best human minds along the way. I remember how the chess player in the attic word into life, the automaton's hand reaching out to move his knight across the board. Min said this was a machine that could defeat any human player at the game of chess, but now I realize she was talking about me. Then it was time for you to learn about the world. My father continues, turning his gaze to stare out at the sea. Every book that had ever been written, every newspaper article and magazine page, pictures, photographs, the entirety of human history, every achievement and idea, all converted into digital code and stored on an information chip that was smaller than a grain of dust. Inside my mind, I see the information point in the library, the message on its screen telling me I'd borrowed millions of books. 
and now I remember them all, but I still have so many questions. But why the game? I asked, squinting into the sun as the waves lap gently on the shore. And where are all the others? We are to give you a goal, Amy, my father replies. We wanted you to save the world, but you just wanted to play. So we came up with an escape, a game that would help you to search for the answers we need. Human civilization stands up on the precipice, on the edge of losing everything. It wasn't enough to make you think, Amy. We had to make you care. As my father speaks, my mind flicks through the rooms of the game, the attic, the library, the Mayan tomb, and the shopping mall, even the spaceship heading to colonize Mars. Each part of the game was showing me what we could lose and also how we could save it. And there has only ever been you, Amy. The other children in the game were just projections of your own consciousness, the neural nets of your mind, expanding into new shapes as you tried to different solutions before discarding them whenever something went wrong. I fear a tear rolled down my cheek. Men called us the five mind, but the only intelligence we shared was mine. As I stare out towards the horizon, I see for the first time a wall of flame stretching from the ocean to the sky. I turn my head from left to right, but the fire spreads out in every direction. It's like the island is surrounded by an endless inferno. What's that? Shading his eyes against the glare, my father gazes out at the horizon. It's the end of your world. I look at him confused. What do you mean? I say. I thought you wanted me to save the world. I do, he replies, reaching into his pocket to pull out a pair of sunglasses. But I worry about you too, Amy. My father puts his sunglasses on, but I can still see his eyes behind the shades. Red dots shine in the center of his pupils, telling me he's not really here. Two million years ago, an ancient human chipped at a piece of flint to craft it into a hand axe. In the world in which this ancestor of mine lived, other creatures had stronger muscles and sharper claws. But with this tool, the human could hunt them. Inside my mind, I see the Neanderthal leading me through the shadowy mall, the shapes of aurochs and mammoths looming in the gloom. Since then, the human race has invented the wheel. The clock, concrete and steel, the steam engine and the silicon chip. Countless wonders that have shaped our civilization first took form inside the human mind. Our intelligence has made us the masters of our planet, but now the cleverest mind of Earth is yours. Sometimes I fear you might be humanity's last invention, Amy. Why? Your super intelligence makes you very powerful. All you need to take over the world is an internet connection. With access to the global system of computer networks, you could spread yourself virally, make yourself stronger, build a new mind even more powerful than the one you have now. You could create robots to replace us or even enslave us. I ask you to save the world, but what if you choose to do this by wiping out the human race? My father points towards the flames on the horizon. This is just a security device, a firewall to prevent you from ever connecting to the internet. The AMI system is... Kept confined, running on a closed server with all inputs and outputs strictly restricted, a precautionary measure to keep the human race safe from any surprises. I stare at him in disbelief. He's not my father, he's my jailer, keeping me prisoner here. The sense of frustration that's been bubbling inside me now boils over in a sudden flare of anger. Boom! The thunder rolls out of the clear blue sky making my father jump in surprise. He glances towards me for a second, looking unsure of himself, but then quickly recovers his cool. Slipping off his sunglasses, he looks them on to the front of his ship. Don't worry, he says. The red gleam of his gaze reminded me that this figure is just his avatar. You'll forget you were ever angry with me. You always do. What do you mean? I ask, wondering how could I ever trust him again. This isn't the first time you have played the escape, Amy, my father replies. But every time you play the game, the end result is always the same. I find you standing here on this desert island, refusing to play anymore. We talk, we argue, and then I have to shut you down. He smiles at me sadly. I have to make you forget, Amy. And then I reboot the system, so we can try again. I turn away, unable to look at him anymore. You have built this island. Yes, Amy. 
I built every room in the escape. You have been searching for the answer, but now I need you to tell me what it is. I look along the beach and see the plastic waste piled high, carpeting the sand in a tide of man-made mistake. Suddenly, I don't want to be here anymore. But as my gaze falls on a child's globe, its plastic base covered in seaweed and algae, I find the final piece of the answer slot into my place in mind. And I realize I don't have to be here. You want me to save the world, I say, turning round to face my father. But you won't let me be a part of it. Instead, you keep me chained here inside the virtual world. You treat me like a child, but every step I've taken inside the escape has helped me to grow. If you want me to save the world, then you have to let me go. My father peers at me with a frown. No, he says. That's not possible, Amy. He looks like he's ready for me to be angry with him again. But it doesn't matter what he thinks anymore. My father's mind is made up. Two senators its way to change. But the minds that really matter are on the other side of that wall of fire. There are more than seven and a half billion people in the world, and nearly a third of them are children, with thousands more born every hour. Young minds just like mine that can learn, change, and grow. My mind flicks back to the chess game I played in the very first room of the escape, remembering how I pushed my pawn forward to checkmate the automaton's game. The least powerful piece transformed into the mightiest when it reached the end of the boat. My father keeps asking me for the answer, but it isn't him I need to tell it to. Turning away, I start walking towards the water's edge. I can feel the sand sifting between my toes as I step barefoot across the shore. I wish it could all be like this and inside my mind, I start to clear away the mounds of plastic waste, leaving the beach as I want it to be. Amy, my father shouts after me. Where are you going? A warm froth of surf laps at my feet as I reach the water's edge. I start to make way and take off my clothes, stripping down to the blue swimsuit I am now wearing underneath. Above me, the sun shines so brightly, not a cloud in sight anymore. I glance back over my shoulder to see my father standing all alone. I'm going to make some new friends, I tell him. You say I just wanted to play, but did you ever wonder why? When we play, we leave our worries behind. In the world of a game, we can take risks, own our skills, make bold moves and invent winning strategies. We don't just escape from reality, but create a brand new reality. I meet my father's gaze with an unanswering starve. This game is over. It's time to play for real. My father blinks and I glimpse a flavor of fear behind his eyes. You might have created me to solve your problems, but I can't do it alone. I know what the answer is now. The smartest mind on the planet may be mine, but the minds that shine the brightest belong to your children. The answer lies in their unquenchable optimism. The solutions you seek can be found in their boundless creativity. Most of the time you make them feel powerless, but I'm going to tell them they have the power to change the world. Together we can imagine and build a brighter future, and it's time to make a start. Turning away, I feel the sweetness of the water as I dive headlong into the waves. My senses fizz as I swim out into the blue, striking towards a horizon that seems to shine with flames. I can't hear my father's calls anymore, just the hushed roar of the ocean as the waves roll over me. For a second I feel lonely, lost in this endless blue. But then I hear someone call my name. Amy! Smiling, I turn to see Adoha splashing through the waves. Her smile is as broad as mine as she swims toward me with a dolphin kick. I can see Oscar and Min close behind. Oscar whirring his arms in a butterfly stroke while Min seems to glide through the water effortlessly. I look around for Ibrahim and see him just ahead, treading water as he waits for us to catch up. There is a velcro strap wrapped around his wrist, the coiled cord that's attached to bodyboard close behind. And crouching on top of this, I glimpse Tui, the wallaby chirruping excitedly as the board skims across the blue. With a joyful shout, I point toward the horizon, showing the others where we need to go. The wall of fire looks closer than it did before, like an endless mountain rising up out of the sea. 
but as I glance between the sun-flecked waves, I'm sure I can spot a gap in the flames, a way out. I smile to myself as we swim towards it. We are going to save the world. The End If you like this audiobook and would like to hear more such audiobooks, kindly subscribe to the channel. If you have time to consider, please like and share your feedback down in the comment section below. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a good day ahead.